Now that you've been introduced to all of the four families of biological molecules, it's time to look at how they all come together in order to produce the cell membrane. The first most common and most important part of the cell membrane are of course phospholipids which we were introduced in the lipid section and they are the most important because of the way that they naturally form this double layered structure here called a phospholipid bilayer and as we learned when we talked about phospholipids this composes the overwhelming majority of the structure of the cell membrane. This structure forms naturally because of the fact that phospholipids are amphipathic molecules, meaning that they have both a polar part, that being the phosphate heads of the molecule, and a nonpolar part, that being the large hydrocarbon tail structures that form the inside of the phospholipid bilayer. And just as a review, because phospholipids have a full negative charge, that allows them to very easily attract to water outside of the cell, which we find most likely in your blood or extracellular fluid. But this can also happen on the inside of the cell because on the inside of the cell is the cytoplasm where most of the water in the cell is, which means that the negatively charged phosphates can form ion dipole attractions to water both outside the cell in the blood and inside the cell in water. Now, conversely, the nonpolar hydrocarbon tails, because they are nonpolar, cannot form hydrogen bonds with water, so instead, they form dispersion force attractions, which again are the only intermolecular forces that nonpolar molecules can form, and they simply do this with each other because again, they cannot form hydrogen bonds with water. If we want to get more complicated, they can also form dispersion force interactions with cholesterol molecules that stabilize the membrane and with the nonpolar parts of proteins that are found embedded within the cell membrane. Now, the phospholipid bilayer is a very interesting structure from an evolutionary perspective as well, because even before living cells evolved, phospholipids had to develop at some point, because if we didn't have phospholipids, we would have no cell membrane. But if you had enough phospholipids by themselves and drop them into water, they would form a naturally spherical phospholipid bilayer structure, which is what we call a liposome and biologists that study the development of life believe that this was one of the most important steps in the formation of the first cells because any living thing that was able to form a bilayer like this would have a protective advantage that other living things would not be able to have. Now even though phospholipids compose most of the mass of the cell membrane, the second most important component are obviously proteins, which we can see continuously embedded all throughout the cell. In the next video, we'll look at what these proteins actually do, but for now we can learn the classification of these proteins depending on their location and placement within the cell membrane. The first of which, if we take a look at this channel protein here, whose job is to allow substances to pass in and out of the cell because they pass completely through the cell membrane, that being all the way from one end of the membrane to the other end of the membrane, we call these integral proteins because they are integral through the whole structure. They are also known as transmembrane proteins because again, they go all the way from one end of the cell membrane to the other. Now, if we look on the inside of the cell membrane, we can see this example of a protein here is only found on one side of the cell membrane. It's only pointing to the inside, uh, whereas we can see some, uh, this is probably a transmembrane protein here, we can see some examples of proteins that are only found on the outside and regardless of what side these are found on, these are what we call peripheral membrane proteins, meaning that they're only found on one side of the cell membrane. And again, in the next video, we'll explore a few reasons why these might be.
Now, if we look at this particular peripheral protein here, we see that is it isn't actually embedded within the cell membrane at all. This is what we call a lipid-anchored protein, meaning that instead of being embedded within the phospholipid bilayer, it's actually covalently bonded to some sort of lipid that we find in the membrane. It could be to a phospholipid or it could be to a cholesterol molecule. It depends on what the function of this protein is. Finally, if we look at this integral transmembrane protein here, we can see if we look at these little clusters of hexagons here, that this protein is not actually purely protein. This is what we call a glycoprotein, meaning that it is actually mostly protein with a few short polysaccharides that we find on the ends here. And as we'll look at in the next video, glycoproteins for the most part are used in cell-to-cell -cell identification so that one cell knows what the function of another cell close by is. Now we can't really call these short chains of saccharides polysaccharides because they're relatively short and contain relatively few individual monosaccharides and that's why we use the prefix oligo which means few. So these are what we call oligosaccharides which again identify this as glycoprotein rather than a pure protein. Now taken as a whole the cell membrane is a complex mixture of both phospholipids and cholesterol, many different structures of proteins and even carbohydrates that appear on the glycoproteins particularly those that are found on the outside. Now taken as a whole, we use the term fluid mosaic to describe this complex mess of biomolecules that compose the cell membrane. And we can look at the significance of each of these words individually. So first we'll start with fluid, which is relatively easy to talk about because fluid is a noun and the verb form of fluid is to flow which means that all of the components of the cell membrane can move within the cell membrane relatively freely and actually this makes perfect sense. We know even looking at the phospholipids that their negatively charged phosphate heads don't want to be close together because of the repulsion force and because phospholipids are only held together through intermolecular attractions, mostly the dispersion forces in the tails, that means that they are not attached to each other with a covalent bond and can generally migrate freely within this membrane here. This also applies to proteins as well, particularly transmembrane integral proteins. So even if we expect there to be positive charges holding this protein close to the negatively charged phosphate heads, and likewise we expect that this region here would be nonpolar to attract to the nonpolar hydrocarbon tails inside the membrane, what we don't generally see are covalent bonds anchoring this membrane pro protein in, which allows the protein itself to move relatively freely within the membrane here. And this is generally true with very, very few exceptions of most structures within the cell membrane, hence the term fluid. The word mosaic is a little bit more complicated to talk about, so we will go to art as our inspiration. This type of painting or artwork is what we call a mosaic, and we can see that even though it has a very distinct image, uh, obviously inspired by a certain Van Gogh painting, uh, the mosaic is actually made of a whole bunch of individual tiles that are each only one color. Now, if we were to take this mosaic and make it entirely out of white tiles, obviously we wouldn't be able to make this picture. Likewise, if we were to make it out of dark blue tiles, we wouldn't be able to compose this picture here, likewise with yellow tiles, and so on. It's only through the very specific arrangement and the very specific mixture of different colored tiles that gives us something more beautiful than the sum of its parts.
So if we apply this to cells, if we think of the different components of the cell membrane, can you have a cell membrane without phospholipid? Well, then you don't have the bilayer, which means that the membrane doesn't form. Can you have a cell membrane without protein? Again, the answer would be no, because then the cell membrane would lose all of its function. So without any single component, whether it be cholesterol, phospholipids, or any of the proteins, the membrane will lose its proper function, and this is why the term mosaic is used. If we look in more detail, um, let's take a look at the membrane's symmetry. Does the inside of the membrane look exactly the same as the outside of the membrane? Well, that answer is obviously no. We can see that there are only glycoproteins on the outside of the membrane, so our membrane is clearly asymmetrical. And just like in the mosaic, the very, very specific arrangement of colored tiles is what gives the painting its cohesive whole. And if any of these components are placed in the wrong location, the membrane would not function properly. And just like with the painting, in the same way we couldn't have a painting out of only blue tiles or white tiles, we cannot make a cell membrane out of only phospholipids, nor can we make a cell membrane out of only protein or only cholesterol or only carbohydrates. We need the exact composition and balance of each of these elements in order to compose the membrane. Finally, uh, is this mosaic the same as every other mosaic painting that exists? Well, artists should be insulted by that. The obvious answer to that is no. And in the same way, if we look at a nerve cell, a red blood cell, a muscle cell, or two different white blood cells, it's absurd to expect their exact compositions of the membrane would be identical because each of these different cells has a different function, which means the balance of each of the different components of the cell membrane, just like this painting, is critical in order for these cells to be able to function, and that is why we use the term fluid mosaic. In the next video, we'll learn specifically about what all of the different membrane proteins do and why each of them has a very specific role to play in the function of the cell membrane.